All right. Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining us. My name is Tasha Ardalan. I'm the program coordinator for the San Diego Region Irrigated Lands Group. Please feel free to reach out to me with any questions pertaining to compliance with the general ag order. Today's presentation will satisfy one hour of required education for irrigated lands group members. Remember, two hours of education are required annually. Our distinguished presenter today is Dr. Jerry Spinelli of UC Cooperative Extension. He will educate us on evapotranspiration and irrigation scheduling. Jerry, take it away. Thank you, Tasha. Hello, everybody. Um, it's great to see um, so many of you. Um, today, we're talking about evapotranspiration. And this, um, this uh, uh, presentation is being recorded. So uh, in case you fall asleep halfway through, um, this, this video is going to be um, on YouTube. So you can watch it again um, in case you have trouble falling asleep. Today, I want to talk about evapotranspiration. That is this concept that is very useful to tell us how much we should irrigate um, on a, in a, considering a relatively long period of time. So I, I changed the title slightly to, 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 to convey this idea. So evapotranspiration is something that tells you how much you should irrigate this week or, or, or this month. And it's very useful to kind of uh, estimate whether there is potential for savings in, um, in, in irrigation, uh, in how much you're irrigating. Some of you may be um, grove um, avocado and citrus growers. Some of you may be nursery growers. Um, some of you uh, may be vegetable growers. And please um, raise your hand if I forgot um, somebody. But the good thing about this concept, this evapotranspiration, is that can be applied to a wide range of uh, uh, crops. As a matter of fact, you can apply it to a wide range of surfaces. You can apply it to a desert. You can apply it to a lake, as we'll, we'll see later. And in this first slide, I put um, these two pictures because I will be saying this concept many times during the presentation, trying to, to, to drive the point home. And so here I put this map of California. And for those of you that are more visual learners, I want you to remember that this is the map of reference evapotranspiration. We will define that concept in a minute, but I want you to start remembering this. It's also called ETO. And it's something that depends on your location, depends on, on where you are. So each color in this map is color coded and tells you what the ETO, what the reference evapotranspiration is, um, depending where you are. So again, reference, reference evapotranspiration is something like the weather, like the climate that depends on your location and has no plant information inside it. It's purely weather, and so it's purely um, influenced by the location. Um, on the other hand, uh, I put this picture of this crop coefficient that um, tells you about your crop, tells you whether your crop is small, whether your crop is big, whether it covers a lot of soil, um, whether it started dying, and so it's, it's a nest, and so uh, this crop coefficient is where the information about our plants, about our crops, and also about their physiology is um, contained. So on one side, we have this reference of transpiration, that is the climate and your location. On the other side, you have this KC, this crop coefficient that tells you about the, um, the influence of the plants. So I'm going to first start with one slide that some of you may have seen already. Forgive me uh, to bore you again with this, but many folks get these concepts wrong. And so I really need everybody to be on board with those. Then I'm going to define reference evapotranspiration, crop evapotranspiration. Again, they're called ETO and ETC. 
and I'm going to talk about how we can use them for our purposes, that is deciding how much we want to irrigate. And then I'm going to talk about some other factors that determine how much water we use in our operation. And at the end, I'm going to talk about some resources, including um, a quick and dirty way that you can use to calculate how much water, based on your water bill, that you get from your uh, utility um, water districts, um, how much water you have applied, and if and if there is space, if there is potential for um, improving your management. So first thing I want to talk about is water volume and depth. Um, when I was a kid, uh, I used to listen to this um, weather, uh, to the news, and I used to hear this, this, um, this person saying, ah, we're going to get uh, one inch of rains overnight. And I was there scratching my head and say, how, is it possible? how can you measure rain in inches, right? I mean, you can measure the length of something in inches, but how can you measure the rain um, in inches? So I want to talk about this concept of one acre inch. Um, so imagine one uh, big pool, one big pool that has one area of one acre. And inside of this pool, there is one inch of water. So think about this slab, this slab of water that has one area of one acre and one inch of depth in it. This volume of water will correspond to 20, about 27,000 gallons. And we call this volume of water one acre inch, not one acre divided inch, one acre multiplied by inch, right? So you shouldn't write it acre slash inch, you wanna write acre inch because it's, it's, it's the acre, the area multiplied by the inch that is the height, right? Like when we were kids and the, and the teacher was telling us, if you wanna calculate the volume of this solid, you have to multiply the area by the height. It's the same, it's the same concept. And again, for those um, like me that, that are visual learners, I put these this 14 water trucks. So when I think, when I think about the, an, acre, an acre inch, I see, I see these 14 um, water trucks. And so I think, oh, okay, then we're talking about the volume. So if each truck has 2,000 gallons, then the total is 28,000 gallons. And as a rule of thumb, We'll see better later, but as, is, as a rule of thumb, this quantity, these 14, these this 14 water trucks are also how much how how much water um, is used by one acre um, in in one week. Um, so um, yesterday I was uh, in my yard and I was staring into my neighbor's yard and my neighbor is rich and he has this big pool and the pool was empty and I was there drinking my um, Italian coffee there and I was staring into into his yard and then I finished my coffee and I forgot the mug in my yard and then over time we got one inch of rain. Overnight, we got one inch of rain. And then the next morning, I went there and I saw my mug had one inch of water, right? It has a small volume, but it had one inch of water. And the pool, my neighbor's pool also had one inch of water in it, right? So the pool had a very big volume and the mug had this very small volume, but the, but the height was one was one inch on both because the, the pool intercepted the, the large area of rains and the mug intercepted a small area of, of rains, but the, but the depth was the same. And this, this trick, you can use this trick for evaporation too. So I left my, I left my, my mug there and my neighbors left his, the water inside the pool. And after a week, after a week, I walked in my yard again, and my, my mug was empty. All that water had evaporated. And all that water had evaporated also from the, from, the, from the pool. So again, the area of evaporation is larger, so more volume evaporates, but the, but the depth, the depth was the same. And you can use this concept um, to express how many range you get to the location, right? So we can say things like, uh, 
in San Diego, we get 10 inches of rain, of rains every year. Or you can say in, in, in Escondido, we get eight, eight inches of, of, uh, of rain per year, per year. And you can also use this as um, wood reuse. So you can say things like uh, Almonds require 55 inches of water in the Central Valley or, or, or 50, right? And so then we can use we can use this concept to compare things independent of how big your almond orchard is, right? It doesn't matter if you have one acre of almonds or you have uh, 2,000 acre of almonds, they're still using 50 inches of water. And so now we can we can use this to fight about, ah, oh, no, we should not uh, grow alpha alpha in the Central Valley. We shouldn't grow pistachios. We should grow, we should, we should send all the water down to LA, et cetera. Right, so it's a way. It's a way that you can compare things independent, independent of the of the area. And here I put all these uh, conversion factors that you can use to convert gallons into acre feet, into acre inches, um, etc. So here I put two questions for you. Um, um, if anybody gets them right, you can text, you can text the answer to me and if I'll show you the phone number at the end of the presentation. If you get them right, you win a dollar. You win a dollar. So I will I will I will Venmo one dollar if you get it right. Um, yes, Patricia, I will share this with everybody. I will share this with everybody. Email me email me, I'll show you the email at the end of the um, at the end of the presentation and I will send you a link to this um, to this uh, presentation. As everybody on board with with this slide, is there anybody is confused with this? Is anybody still scratching their head and say, well, Jerry, really, I don't understand why one inch and why evaporation is also one inch. Everybody is either completely on board with this, or really, com or, or or completely confused, or completely asleep. All right. So, no, but nobody answers. I'm gonna move to the next slide. But please email me or or, or call me if you have any questions. What is evapotranspiration? Well, scientists have a lot of free time. And so they imply it um, inventing weird words. One of those is this one, evapotranspiration. They, they, they took evaporation and transpiration and they put them together. And the reason why they did that is that these two variables, the evaporation that is how water leaves a surface and transpiration that is how water leaves a, a, a leaf or, 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 or a plant surface, are driven by the same um, variables. So there is ways to separate the two. There, there is models that separate the two, um, but typically they are treated uh, together just because what, what affects one will affect also the other. And uh, when we were young and we studied, those of you that took chemistry will remember that was this teacher that told you, ah, you have to calculate um, whether this reaction happens spontaneously and you have to cal calculate this Gibbs free energy and you have to go at the end of this big book and you have to calculate, uh, you have to look up for each, uh, for each reaction, how much is the enthalpy and how much is the entropy and then you have to put it in this equation and it will tell you whether it, uh, it evaporates spontaneously. So luckily for you today, I'm not gonna bore you with all that stuff, but the point is that water, if you, if you go through those calculation, it turns out that water spontaneously evaporates. Water in this world really wants to evaporate because it has so much gain from this uh, thing called uh, entropy. However, it requires energy. So uh, water spontaneously evaporate, but it, 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 it will take energy from the environment. And you know, you realize that when you get out of the, of the swimming pool and you're there stretching on the, on the, on the poolside, and now, now the wind blows and you feel cold, right? Because the, 
but that water evaporates from your from your surface and it takes heat from you that's why you feel cold so um keep in mind that water needs energy needs something to provide that energy that it needs to evaporate so why are we interested in this evaporation and in this transpiration we put them together in this concept because one of the strategies that we can use to to decide how much we irrigate is to deliver how much water was lost by evapotranspiration so i have my fields if if some scientist came up with a model or with a way for me to estimate how much evapotranspiration my my avocado orchard or my or my field of tomatoes or of lettuce used last week then i could use that same quantity i could irrigate that same quantity and and that would be the way i figure out what my irrigation scheduling should be uh, other other irrigation strategies may be just to measure the, the the soil moisture with soil sensor right but but et it's helpful particularly evapotranspiration is helpful particularly if you want to measure on a long period of time this week or this month or this three months so uh definitions crop evapotranspiration is called etc and this is what we're what we're after it tells you how much water left from your plants how much your crop used and it's determined by your climate right if it was windier if it was hotter we lost more uh, water and it's also de determined by your cropping system uh, how wide your beds are are your um, are your um, alleyways between uh, rows of avocados do they have do they have uh, um, um grass in it or not so we need we want to find this etc so we can decide how much to irrigate um instead reference evapotranspiration is the one in the map at the beginning right and it's something again that is determined only by the location where you're at and by the weather so it's something that depends on the weather just like air temperature or just like the wind and you can you can you can think when you think about evapotranspiration you can you can think about the potential for evaporation of the atmosphere the evaporative demand of the atmosphere so if i'm here today in escondido how much does my atmosphere require uh, water to evaporate how fast does the uh, the, the atmosphere um, requires water to evaporate and here I put I put some representations of these two variables. Somebody somebody measured the uh, ETC, so the crop evapotranspiration for this bell pepper here, these black dots. And you can see at the beginning it's really small because the plants are small, and the leaves are small, and so they don't require as much wood. They don't they don't evapotranspire as much. And instead, the the white the white dot is EPO, is reference evapotranspiration that was higher at the beginning. But 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 notice that as the crop develop, as the as it as the plants got bigger, the the crop um, intercepts more lights and covers the canopy cover covers more soil, and so um, crop evapotranspiration goes up. And you see in at this at this uh, at this um, end of the cycle, uh, crop evapotranspiration is even higher than reference evapotranspiration. And this is another representation for corn. It shows the same thing. Um, reference uh, um, crop ET is lower at the beginning, and then it, it grows as the as the crop grows. The crop coefficient is um, something that tells you is the ratio between these two. So is a factor that you use to correct to correct. You take your reference ct you correct it with your kc that again contains information about your plant and about your your st um, your stage um, in the cycle in its cycle and use it to calculate crop et so um 
let's talk about reference evapotranspiration. It's something, as I said, that depends on the weather, and you can calculate you can calculate it um, by measuring some um, weather variables with the weather station. And this is what CIMIS does. CIMIS is the California Irrigation Management and Information System that is an office that originally started at Davis and then DWR, DWR took it over. And uh, I, think, I think it started about 30 years ago. And what they do, they put this weather station all around the state. And you can go on their website and you'll see a map of all these stations um, um, on all these stations um, where you um, where you can also connect and download the data for for any station that you want. And again, the data that you download is called reference evapotranspiration. And, uh, and this is based on the fact that depending on where you are in the state of California, even if you grow the same crop, um, that crop will, will need different amount of water. So, um, so that's, that's how you take into consideration the location. It was originally um, um, conceived to express what grass would do. So, so reference evapotranspiration tells you how much grass, how much surface of grass would transpire in, in those conditions. And the reason why they chose grass is that grass is a simple, is a simple surface to um, develop, right? So you have the you can you can irrigate it and develop in a in a relatively dry environment like this one or in a weather environment or if it's cold or if it's winter or if it's uh, summer so they chose this surface to um because it's easy it's easy to um build a, a lawn in uh, in in any location so now it's my first attempt to wake you up and I want all of you to tell me in the chat what are the variables um, driving evapotranspiration and evapotranspiration. What are the weather factors that you think will um, drive more or faster evaporation from a surface? Or you can think again about the example of the pool, right? You're there stretching on the pool side. Okay, we've got heat and humidity, we've got temperature, we've got extreme temperature, we've got rain. So now I don't want to talk about rain yet. I just want to talk about what makes okay, okay, we've got wind. We are we are missing the one. size of the plant. There is four of them. The size of the plant the plant plays a role thank you very much for that comment but that's not that's not something that is part of reference of transpiration the plant everything that has to do with the plant we consider in that crop coefficient remember those two pictures i showed in the first slide so everything that has to do with the plant goes into the crop coefficient but thank you that's a that's a very good question that's a very good point and now we're talking about weather, weather things, weather things that affect um, that affect how much your how fast your body will evaporate, how much how how fast um, water will evaporate from your body while you're there stretching on the pool side. There is no plants, there is no soil, there is no there is no other things. And I see that Frank Frank got it right, and Suzanne too. Congratulations! You win you win the one dollar. And the factors are, and the factors are, and these four factors are what this weather station measures. The factors are solar radiation, that is the strongest driver. Solar radiation is the strongest driver. Um, air temperature, as as almost everybody guessed, 
fair humidity, and wind speeds. So again, these are the four climatic, the four weather factors that drive this concept of um, evaporative demands of the atmosphere, the reference of evapotranspiration. Uh, are there any questions about this? No questions? Is everybody on board? Okay, let's take it a, a step further. Uh, I, I collected this data from the, I connected to the website, to the CIMIS website, and I downloaded the data for, for San Diego. In October, when I started with this job, I said, well, I'm moving to this area. I better, I better get on board. I better do my homework. And this is what the, and there, and, and, and there are three stations Escondido, Miramar, and Torrey Pines, and this is how much reference of evapotranspiration the CIMI station give you. Again, no soil information, no plant information, only climate. And this is how much, how much evapotranspiration in inch we get per, per, per month. And the point that I'm trying to illustrate here is that you can see the high variability between the weather station at Torrey Pines that is close to the ocean Miramar that is somewhat inland and Escondido that is a lot more inland. So you can clearly see this gradient um, of the location, just like we saw earlier that map of California with the different colors. So depending on where you are located, keep in mind um, that there is a strong variability here between coastal conditions and more inland conditions. And this is the same data, but this time plotted per week. So this tells you each of these numbers, this tells you how many inches of evapotranspiration um, your, your crop will require um, based on the weather and ba based on where you are. And you see, these, th most of these values are about are around one inch, and that's the rule of thumb that I gave you at the beginning with the with the with the water trucks. If you remember those fourteen water trucks per acre, and and notice that there is this dip here, and at the beginning when I saw it, I said something is wrong with this data. So then I connected again and I downloaded it again, and I was scratching my head and say, what's wrong with this picture? And that's because I hadn't, I hadn't lived in Southern California yet. And, and this is what we call June, June, um, June gloom and May gray, right? You can see that evapotranspiration is try to go up, but then we get this, we get this uh, season when we get a lot of uh, marine layer and a lot of clouds and a lot of um, uh, colder weather during those, um, during those late spring, beginning of summer months. So this is this is and, and, and you can see that it's more it's more um, it happens more closer to the ocean and not a lot inland um, inland in Escondido. But uh, but the point of this the point of this slide is keep in mind that we are about one inch and depending on where you are in this in when you are located de depending on your conditions, you will be around between half inch uh, during winter up to 1.5, 1.6 inches per week uh, during summer. If you remember only one number from this presentation, please, please remember this one. Please remember this one. Okay, so uh, again, that's map that map of uh, of California, and the same concept is used all over the world, right? I have I had a girlfriend that lived in in Seattle, and I lived in in Davis at the time, and I would fly and and uh, and visit her, and she would say, Ah, you're my Italian boyfriend, you're my little zucchini. She would call me my you're my little zucchini, and so one time. I was about to fly to Seattle uh, 
uh, to visit her. And so I, I went to Home Depot and I bought these two plants of zucchini, one for me and one for her. And so I planted it and one I, I, took, I, I, I took up to Seattle. To Seattle, same plant, same number of leaves, same, same variety, same development. And so she was up here in Seattle where it is this dark green. And I was down here in Davis where it's instead is this yellow, right? And you can see we were like four, four steps in this, in this uh, scale of uh, evapotranspiration apart. And so uh, one month later we were on the phone and I'm like, ah, oh, baby, did you water your zucchini plant? And he said, not, not yet, I didn't. And instead I was watering it every time every day. So again, same plant, same development, same uh, variety. It uses a lot more water in Davis and a, less, and a lot less water in Seattle because reference evapotranspiration is less, because the temperature is cooler, because the humidity is, 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 uh, is, is not as dry because the sun doesn't shine as much. And because what was the other one? Who remembers? Who remembers? Because the wind doesn't blow as much, right? So all these variables together determine this, this reference of evapotranspiration. So now to wake you up again, I want you to guess ET for the following surfaces. So let's say that we are in a week, we are in, in Escondido in April, the, the second week of April, we had one inch of evapotranspiration, of reference evapotranspiration. And here I say grass, right? Remember, we said that the, um, that the reference of evapotranspiration um, refers to grass. So I want you to guess if grass requires one inch, how much do you think that the corn that is flowering would require? Two inches, one and a half, three, five, probably more, right? Anthony says one. Thank you, Anthony. Probably a little more, I would say, because the grass, think about the grass is just, it's not very, it's not a very tall canopy. And three inches. All down there. Okay, Patricia says one and a half. Corn is a lot taller, right? is a lot taller. 1.2, James. Mm, I like what you said, James. Um, how about strawberry? How about strawberry? Well, water strawberries. Well, you know, strawberries, they grow them on these beds, you know, and it's, it's, uh, and in, be in between they have these, these curves where they, where the pickers have to walk to pick these berries, right? And so, so it doesn't, it's not, if you, if you were to look at it from the, from the top, John says one, John says one. Uh, strawberry from the top, you would see a lot of ground, right? You would see a lot of brown um, soil surface. So I would guess that strawberry would be a little less because it doesn't intercept as much um, light as grass, right? How about the lake? How about the lake? One would say more than more than grass, right? How much more? Twice? Thrice? Three. Three. Paul says three. James says two. All right. So when I started this stuff 15 years ago, 20 years ago at the University of Florence, I would have guessed like Andy just did. Three. I would have guessed three. And when they gave me the answer, I just didn't accept it. I just say, that's impossible. You guys got it wrong. You guys got it wrong. It's, it's not possible. And finally, how about lettuce? See that a month ago, like a, a, a one month old lettuce plant is like this big, right? So again, if you were to fly over and look at that feed, it would look, it would look mostly, mostly brown, right? So the, the, the plant doesn't intercept a lot of, a lot of light. So probably uh, ET will be lower than grass. 
Okay, now that everybody's there biting their fingernails, the answer are 1.2 for corn. James got it right. Strawberry is less, 0.85. The lake is only 10% more than grass. <laughs> I, I I don't know I don't know how is that possible. It's not my fault. A parking lot is zero, right? Because it's dry. It has nothing to evaporate. It's concrete, right? Or asphalt. There's it doesn't contain any water unless somebody wets it daily. It cannot evaporate. It has zero. And let us just because the plants are so small, are so small. It's just a fifth of grass. Okay, now this this ratio. So this is so we just guessed we just guessed what ETC is, right? The crop evapotranspiration, right? And you can see that it, there is a ratio, there is a there is a proportion, there is a proportion to to reference ET to grass ET, right? So now I want you to guess it. For my girlfriend, remember we said, well, my girlfriend up in Seattle didn't have to water her her zucchini plant as much as much as Jerry that was down in in uh, in Davis. So let's say that Seattle in that same uh, um, week in April had half had half of our reference CT. So I wanted to guess how much that corn would have used if it had been in Seattle instead of in Escondido. Kim says 0.6. Thank you, Kim. Anybody else? Any other guesses? 0.5. Wesley says, says yes, less. Ooh, Ralph says 5. Patricia says 0.1. Okay, how about that um, strawberry? If ETO was half, how much was for that strawberry? How about that lake? Well, the answer is if ETO was half, if reference ET was half, then, then the crop ET follows accordingly. So if it if it was half of, of one inch, it was still point it was point five. Then for corn was half two. For strawberry was would have been half two. For a lake would have been half two. Does it make sense? Yeah. Does it? Thank you, Crystal. So now <laughs> so now you can say, okay, the proportion, the proportion of my reference ET is this much. So now I can say, well, I have my corn seed in my pocket. I'm gonna emigrate to Australia or to, I don't know, Tokyo or whatever, to Reykjavik. And I know, and I know what proportion of, of reference of transpiration my corn needs. So when I get to Reykjavik, I just have to call the weather station and say, hey, how much was reference ET this week? And I, and I know that I just have to multiply by 1.2 to find out how much I, I have to irrigate my corn. Does it make sense? Yes. OK, thank you, Troy. So this, this, this number, this proportion, this proportion that you can use when you when you emigrate to Tokyo, we call it the crop coefficient. It tells you how much more or how much less or 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 what or what proportion of of the reference um, your crop used. Now I wanted to guess it one only once more for the Sahara Desert or for the I don't know Atacama Desert or maybe for the for the Death Valley. Um, I guess it's for corn that you eat, Ralph. I'm not sure. When I grew when, when I grew it with KC 1.2 was for was for we we used to sell it for eating. Um, 
So now I want everybody to guess it for the Death Valley, for the Death Valley, where for that same week in April, where here in Escondido we had one inch um, of you reference CT, and up in Seattle, my girlfriend had half inch. Down in the Death Valley, we had two inches of reference CT. So we have our crop percentage here. 2.4, thank you. Thank you, Crystal, and thank you, John. 2.4, how about that strawberry? Who wants to tell me? 1.7. Thank you, Troy. Correct. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, everybody. You're really making my day. How about that lake? 2.2. 2. 2. Okay, everybody got it. You're making, you're, 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 I'm a happy man. How about the parking lot? Zero. Zero. Still zero, right? Because it doesn't matter. It's still dry. It's still dry. How about the lettuce? Point, Point four. four. Point four. All right. All right. Thank you. Now I'm going to give you a break. Thank, thank you, everybody. I really appreciate it. So how do we use, how do we use this game? Say that I'm in Fallbrook and I have my avocado grove and I want to calculate my ETC, my, my crop uh, evapotranspiration to decide how much to, to irrigate. So I look up reference CT, I look my KC, I multiply the two, I get, I get reference CT from the, from the weather station, I get my KC from a book, or I call, or I call Jerry or, or, the, or another pharma, or another, um, uh, farm advisor for, for, for avocado I call Sonia Rios. She tells me I multiply by the ATO that I got from Sinis. Now I get my ETC that tells me both about my location and about my crop. And now I know how much I should irrigate. And again, this crop coefficient in the, in the, in the, uh, in the example, um, in the previous slide, we kept it, we kept it constant, right? We said corn is 1.2, but in reality, it changes. It increases as the crop grows. And the shape that it has, depending on the crop, is low at the beginning when the plant is small, and then it increases as the, as the plants grow. This is the typical shape that you would have with, with corn, right? It would be a curve that starts slow, start, start low, and then it slowly grows until a maximum and it stays there. And for some crops, it goes down at the end um, because some, some plants like corn start senescing, right? Starts, starts drying naturally when it gets at the end of the cycle. This I put it, I put this uh, shape also here from, for somebody that, that calculated for a greenhouse. So this game, this game works also for those of you that are nursery growers or, or greenhouse growers. You can play, you can play this game too. It will, not, it will be more difficult because it's harder to find a KC for your crops from the book. But the, the, the framework still, still holds. Um, so, so always remember that the KC, that this crop coefficient is something that changes. That's something that changes through the season. And here I put, I put some crop coefficients. Um, this table is taken from the from the FAO manual 56. When I was studying this stuff, this this manual was relatively new. It was published in 1998, so it was the new thing, and we were all reading it, and it was the hippest thing, and and we were really cool because we knew everything about irrigation, and we were into water, we were gonna save the world. Now it's kind of an older publication, but it's still it's still relevant. So and and you can see I put this example, I put this example just to draw your attention to the fact that depending on what kind of cropping system you have, you will have different cases. And here, for example, for avocado, it gives us 0.6 at the beginning of the season, 0.85 in the middle, and 0.75 towards the end. 
But then if you compare them with the, with the crop coefficients also from avocado from the University of California, they don't match. So just be very careful where you get your cases from because it's not, it's kind of given to you as a universal thing, like, ah, avocado use this much. But in reality, it has a lot of other information, not only from the plant, but depending on the, on the variety, on the cropping system, and on, and on other things um, that you do. Um, this is another picture taken from FAO 56 that shows you the KC and you can see the, the crop coefficient of, vario, of various crops and you can see that most of them, okay, unless okay. you're on big island and you're growing pineapples, okay, most, okay. of them, most of them um, are within 0 0.8, 0 0.7 and 0.2. So more, more, most of them use about 70% of what grass uses in the same uh, location up to 1.2. Um, Twenty percent more than grass uses in that location. So now we are happy. We know everything about uh, crop evaporation <laughs> and how to calculate it, and uh, and we know how to irrigate. But there are two more things. There are two more things that determine how much water we should use. The first of them is the distribution uniformity, and some of you have heard me. Uh, talking for one hour, um, boring you to death about exactly. distribution uniformity. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. So, <laughs> so this distribution uniformity is some number, is some numbers that tells you how uniform your irrigation <laughs> system is. And the lower the number, the less uniform, the less uniformly your water is applied. And so, if it's not if it's not very uniform, if, if it doesn't apply water very uniformly, then you have to apply more water. You have to apply more right. water to make up for the back uniform for that bad uniformity to make sure that those plants that receive less water still receive enough, right? So um, the way you the way you calculate how much water you need, you take this ETC, this crop evapotranspiration that you now know everything about. Yes, Mark. Yes, Mark says, Mark asks, Mark asks, Mark asks whether the solar, uh, the slope and the orientation, the aspect, if you are on a hill, how that affects um, evapotranspiration, and that's a big problem. That's one of the factors yep. of the details that I glossed over in this presentation because it's it's complicated. And, yep. and as far as I know, there isn't an easy way to uh, deal with it. Um, the person to talk to is uh, Rick Snyder at UC Davis. He's the evapotranspiration guru in California, meaning that in the world, and uh, but that's a that's a that's a tough one. That's a tough one. Um, but now I want to go back. I want to go back to to this idea. How much water is recommended that I that I irrigate? I take my ETC. That now we now we learned how to how to calculate it, and I divide my distribution uniformity. The lower my distribution uniformity, drip usually has has distribution uniformity in the 90s, sprinkler in the 70s, 80s, if you're really doing a good job. So when I divide by that number, you see that what I apply is 10% more or 30% more, right? Just because of our distribution uniformity. So this is why folks like myself and agencies, et cetera, are so focused on this DU. They always talk about DU. We always talk about you because this has a strong yeah. effect. This has a strong effect on how much water you need to uh, apply. That increases. That increases. Micro sprinklers are a little better than than sprinklers, uh, Douglas. I. I I measured the DU last month at a nursery that uses micro sprinklers, and we were in the 80s. 
which is a very, very, very respectable DU for sprinklers. So they were doing a good job, but but there is a high variability there. I've seen I've seen people with micro sprinklers having horrible DUs. So uh, it's a little difficult to generalize, Douglas. The best thing we can do is measure it and talk to me, Douglas, if you want to do it. So, but now I want to talk about the second thing because I am running out of time. The second thing that you need to apply more water for, which is uh, leaching requirement. And somewhat paradoxically, we need to apply more water apply more. to leach the salts that we have applied into the root zone when we irrigated last time. So we That's need to right. apply more water to leach the salts that we are, that we put there by <laughs> irrigating, right? So, and now I don't want to talk about this. I could I could spend one hour talking about leaching fraction, but I just picked a, an average value from the from the table from the book, and we stick it into the equation. And now you see that that one inch that my that my etc that my plants need now I have to revi to divide by 0.9 because of my du. And by 0.25, by 0.75, because of my leaching fraction. So even if I'm doing a relatively good job with my DU, and even if I have a, a, a salinity, a, an irrigation water that is not very salty, now I'm irrigating 50% more. I have to apply 50% more water because of these two factors. And this brings me to this way of thinking. Let's say that I'm doing a bad job with you. And let's say that I have very, very salty water. This is some, this is some water of a, of a grower um, in, up in San Marcos that is irrigating from, 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 from their well. And they get very, very, very salty water, like 1.9 1, 1 decisiemens per meter is really high. So from the table, from that, for that salinity, we get about 30% of leaching fraction. Let's say my KC is on the high side, like that corn that we saw earlier. Let's say that my distribution uniformity is on the low side, because I'm irrigating with sprinklers and I'm doing a bad job. Let's say that my leaching fraction is high, because I'm irrigating from the well. Let's say that everything went wrong. Everything went wrong. How much water would be recommended in that case? And with this, with this exercise, with this purely theoretical exercise, I calculate 2.3 inches that is close to twice, close to twice, um, actually more than twice than my ETO, right? So if everything goes wrong, you should never irrigate more than two and a half times what Simis told you for that period, for that location. This is, this is my idea. If everything went wrong, even if you had salty water, even if you had a bad irrigation system, even if, even if everything was wrong, you should never irrigate more than two times, two and a half times CDO. So about, twi about twice, but a little bit more than twice, right? So now we can use this idea, and I'm, I'm going to spend my last five minutes to, 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 to illustrate this idea. Now we can use this framework to ask ourselves, OK, let's just have a back of the envelope estimate to ask ourselves, am I over irrigating? So you can get the, your, your, your bill from your water district. And, and now um, there are many water districts and many uh, public utilities authorities in, in San Diego County. And here I put, and here I put a picture of them. Each, each color is one of them. So I don't know which one is sending the water bill that each of you is receiving, but I'm sure that they're telling you how much water you're using for that month whether it's in acre inch or acre feet or gallons or units. Some of them use units or some, some of them use 100 uh, cubic feet. So you take, that, you take that how much that volume of water that you use in that, in that uh, month, you divide it by your acres, 
like we did when we talked about this this uh, this acre inch, and you will obtain how many inches or, or feet of water you have applied. Then you look up from CIMIS how much evapotranspiration was for that period. And if, if your water use was more than twice, more than two and a half ETO, you may have a good reason to call Jerry because probably you're over irrigating. Probably your irrigator is, is running the pump more than, than they should. And, and again, the, the, the rate, the, the cost of water is, is variable, but more or less one acre inch is $200. So there's, there's big bucks to be saved. And at the end of the presentation, I will show you, um, I will give you this bank account where you can wire 15% of all the money that you have saved um, thanks to participating to this presentation, and you're welcome. <laughs> this, is, <laughs> this is a bill from Fallbrook um, uh, District, from Fallbrook uh, Water District. I asked Rainbow too, but I couldn't get it. But this is what this is what a bill um, that some of you receive will look like, and and uh, and be careful that you look for how many gallons each unit corresponds to. In the case of Fallbrook, it corresponds to 1,000. And here they tell you how many units you used for this, for this month. In, in Rainbow, it corresponds to 748 gallons because it's 100 uh, uh, cubic feet. So make sure, that you, make sure that you're calculating the right units. And let's say that you're farming 20 acres. Let's say that your operation is 20 acres, and uh, let's, let's say that your, your water bill charge you for, for um, 11,000 units in April 2021. So let's multiply this unit by 748, because each unit was 748 gallons, and we get about 8 million, 8 million gallons. Then we divide by that secret number, 27,000, uh, gallon per acre inch, and we calculate that we used 300 acre inch for that month during that month. Then I divide by my by my acres, and I calculate that during that month I used 15 inch. This is not per acre, right? Now it's independent of the acre, right? Like like the mug and the and the pool. So that month in April 2021, I used 15, 15 inches. And now I can go to CIMIS and look up reference ET in Escondido in April, and it gives me 5.44 inches. So now I know that I irrigated about three times ETO. Do I have a problem or, or, am, I, or am I fine? Problem major. I have a problem, right? I should call Jerry, or I should call somebody, somebody to help me. I should call somebody that can help me. But this is an easy thing that you can do. This is a very easy thing that you can do. And if you get lost with these calculations, please call me, and I will help you. I do this every day, so it's I'll I'll, I'll help you. In a minute, I can do this for you. And just to show you, I have a flow meter at the at the nursery up in Fallbrook and we are measuring how much water they're using. And here in this graph, I'm comparing it with reference CT and they're really close. So they're doing a really good job. So I'm telling the grower, well, I don't know how your irrigator does this, but, but they're, they're really close to, to reference CT. So in some cases, in some cases you may be doing just the right thing, but this is a way to confirm, to ask yourself uh, where you stand. Okay, with this, I want to show you the resources. This is the website, the CINIS website, where you get, uh, you click here on data. First, you click on register. You make a username, a password, blah, blah, blah. Then you click on data. It kicks you to this table where you, where you pick the, the weather station. Make sure you pick the weather station close to your conditions. And then you can download the uh, reference ET data. Uh, you can Google FAO 56 manual like I did here, and you can download it for free. It's a big, thick PDF that is this big, and you can read it all, and, and it's, it's uh, very entertaining. 
and it has that those tables with the KCs, with the crop coefficients that I showed you earlier. So if you don't know where to find your crop coefficients, just to get an idea, just to get an idea, there are there are many for many crops there. So uh, in summary, we talk about crop ET, we talk about reference ET, we talk about the crop coefficient. We said that DU and the leaching fraction also increase how much water you should uh, apply. And as a rule of thumb, if you irrigate more than two times or two and a half times CTO, probably you have a problem. And CVs and FAO 56 is where to find your reference CT and where to find your KC. With this, thank you so much. It was greatly entertaining to spend the past hour with you. These are my contact information. Call me, text me, email me, whatever you want. If you have questions um, or to claim your dollar, um, this is a survey. Please take, please to take one minute of your time. Um, and with this, I'm done, and um, I'm gonna open for questions. Solar energy. Wait, so did somebody ask a question? We use the phone, the Ralph. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> politicians, Ralph. Huh? Yeah, I can I cannot help you with politicians. It's above my pay grade. Sorry, Ralph. Yeah. Lawrence. A very good presentation. Thank you. Oh, thank you. If you are other questions, everybody feel free to go home. Um, you get the extra points that you need for the irrigated land group for for being for getting to the end alive or at least awake or at least alive. But if you have any more question, I'm gonna hang out for five more minutes. I have one quick question. Yes, sir. Which document specifically has the coefficients for the different crops and trees? FAO 56. Well, many documents, many documents. This is something that people like me that work for universities do all the time. So you may Google, you may Google crop coefficient for, I don't know, <laughs> cucumbers, and you may find some research at the university in, in, uh, in, in Seattle that that came up with some with, with some crop coefficient with with for cucumbers, but FAO 56 this uh, FAO manual 56 here and all you have to do is Google FAO 56 crop evapotranspiration like I did here, and you will be able to download the PDF for free. Um, and download it online. And towards the end, there is this big table. There are all these tables that is the same that I showed here with the avocados. This one. You see, it says table 12 continued. It may be continued for, for 10 pages. So yeah, FAO 56. Okay. Just, just out of curiosity then, is all citrus pretty much the same? It falls under the citrus category. So whether you've got orange or lemon, it's all pretty close. Um, that's what they say here. That's what they say here. But I've seen I've seen also um, different researches, uh, different researchers giving different cases for different citrus species. So here they yeah. mostly they mostly reported to the canopy cover. Um, so they tell you they tell you 20% canopy, 50% canopy. So they say, well, I don't know if it's you have less less canopy because your orchard your grove is younger, or because your lemons are smaller than your um, than what uh, oranges or 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 grapefruit would be. Um, so that this is how they report it. Yeah. So they, they tell and you, I think the lesson from what you told us before is that a, a lot of this is you show two different values for the same thing. So this isn't exact precise calculation. You wanna be a little bit uh, over generous, I guess, on any of it, just to make sure you're not doing too little watering. I guess so. But but another another good way to deal with it would be emailing either Sonia 
Rios that is in my office and she works specifically with, with uh, Citrus, or um, Ben Faber that is in um, that is my colleague from Ventura. They will know. They will know. And I'm I'm a small operation, so close enough was good good for me. <laughs> <laughs> sure, sure. Thank you. Uh, hey, no Jerry. Problem. Uh, Jerry, uh, the equations yeah. you showed have a lot of variables in them, and uh, there's going to be uncertainties to all those variables, and we'd be looking for the sweet spot of applying water to maximize our, our crop yield, and you gave us an upper limit on what uh, overwatering would be. We'd like to shoot for what's the lower limit, and where's the sweet spot so we can save money on our water bills. Is there anywhere any information out there that we could pull up to take a look at? I, I know that's too part of a question for you to answer now, but is there some place we could go to find that? I would I would start from management, Luis. I would start from management. I see I get a lot, I get that question a lot. And I find that there is a lot that can be saved by improving your management. Um, is your distribution uniformity good? Is your pressure is your pressure good? Does your irrigator um, measure soil moisture? Um, have you ever bought? Have you ever played around with a with a tensiometer? You can buy it for a hundred dollars, uh, and you just stick it in the soil and you look at it twice twice a day. And it has a and it has a gauge that tells you how wet the soil is. Um, those are the things that I would start from. Um, if you're if you're already doing a good job uh, uh, from that point of view, um, I guess we can follow up. You can give me a call offline, and we can. It depends a lot of it depends on your specific crop. Um, yeah. And um, please email me, and we can we can we, we can talk about that more. Uh, generally, if you stress your crop, your yield will be reduced in very general terms. Having said that, there is there is phenological phases where um, crops are where the yield is less sensitive. Um, so uh, there is work out there. Um, done to save water um, depending on the specific crop. But I, I, I may have to look, I will have to look into this, into the, into the specific things. Okay, thank you. No problem, but do not hesitate to email me and let's, let's follow up. Okay. Any other questions? Yes, Robert. Yes, Robert. Email me and I'll send you a link to where you can download the presentation. Any other questions out there? John, I have my address here. Um, ah, the survey. The survey, I forgot the survey, is the most important thing. I forgot the survey. I forgot the survey. I have to put it here. You think survey listed, so I got it. I just copied it down. Okay. Uh, are, Jerry, I can also send that in an email for you. That would be great. Um, Jerry, are there still grants available for irrigation, helping farmers with irrigation? Grant. Well, something to help out. Like, I, I know that there was something where they would, or maybe that's when I talked to you, that you come out like, could look at how we are watering and um well, mission I, resource conservation district okay thank you Enrico. yeah i know that there is this uh, sweep grant that is um a cdfa grant i heard that they run out of money but then i also he heard that the governor found some more money for that um effort. what is it called SWEEP, S W E E P, and the person to talk to 
is um, Esther um, Mosase. She's in my office. Okay. Um, so, so if I call you, you, let me know. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, I need to. She's she works half for the university and half for for CDFA, and her job is assisting assisting growers that want to apply for these grants. Great. So she will be helpful again. Her name is Esther Mosase, and you will find her on, on the on the website. Well, um, uh, just just uh, I met with Lance Anderson recently from Mission Research Conservation District, and they have two grants each of five thousand uh, dollars it would be for things like uh, tensiometers and uh, irrigation efficiency and they can also uh, tell you what your du is uh, by testing the sprinklers at your property and that, all of that is free okay and who do i who do i contact specifically um you said mission resource Con conservation district it's in fallbrook they have a website i would i would uh go to their website and, and uh you can get emails and phone number there. Great. Okay. Good. But I'll pick your brain later, Jerry. <laughs> sure. For sure, I'll, I'll call because I, I have a lime grove that's on a hill. So you know, we go through, and I have different types of soil at every. Like the top is loamy, the bottom is kind of more like clay, and so I don't have to water that as much because it retains the water better. And on top, that's why I put soil into my thing because there's a lot of. Um, water depending on the type of soil you have yeah another thing that mission does is they have a device that they walk over the property with uh -huh. and it measures the density of the soil so that you can determine if you have spots that have higher clay content and then have kind of like a, a picture of it uh, so i i would really contact them this is, this is enrico right i'm gonna so I, another question oh gosh so I hear a lot of like we have the spitters and we have like a riser between both trees and we have a really dense densely packed grove we probably have about 700 trees and about five acres and it's like canopy you know the canopies practically touch each canopy and um um okay where was I going with this oh so my husband wants to put in yeah you know, I'm, I'm kind of leery about we have a lot of coyotes too and I and I worry about like the drip systems because because I, you know, the coyote right now, we can tell them we have a leak because we have a geyser, <laughs> but it's like, I can't imagine like walking the whole grove every time we water, to see if there's something bubbling, you know, where it's not supposed to be because the coyotes are chewing it. So do you guys have any like coyote proof? <laughs> it's like, I, I know people say just leave water out for them, but um, maybe they don't know where the water is and it's easier to chew through the pipe. <laughs> Well, this time this time of year, there's a lot of uh, young young coyotes out there, and they're teething, and so they like to chew on the plastic. So it's um, not 100% for the water. Um, yeah. Yeah. So what what do you guys use? Do you use a fence and big dogs? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but I mean, do you use? So I'm sorry. Do you use um, drip then? I would find that you know you end up if you have trees you're gonna the drip drip line is going to be under under leaves in a in a short amount of time and you're gonna have to pick up every single uh pose that you have under the tree to see if the water's still coming out of the drippers because they're yeah. going to be under the leaves and 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 so you you know, it'll be really hard to tell if they're plugged fertilizing yeah. is hard too unless you use a liquid fertilizer right so then what do you do you just stick with yeah so you just stick with the spinners then that's yeah. why i went with the micro emitters because they're still enough water to dissolve fertilizer but they're not so much that you're worrying about wasting it but uh, i had a question on the same topic uh i think there are like Wi-Fi based flow meters that you can attach to your water meter so you can kind of monitor in real time what your water usage is. And if you have some bad leaks, you can probably figure it out. But uh, yeah. what I wanted to ask Jerry was, what's the typical cost on something like that? Of a, of a flow meter? Yeah, the ones that you can hook up so that you can you know, see it on your cell phone or something with a Wi-Fi connection. So there is various companies that that do that, and um, 
I'm not exactly sure what their costs are. Um, the one I showed in the in the in the slide is the is a Netafin uh, flow meter that is one of the most expensive ones. One of the best, of the good ones is a two inch, and that costed me I think seven hundred and fifty dollars. But mm -hmm. that flow is flow meter. Is that uh, just the meter? No, no Wi-Fi on that one, I guess, right? Exactly, exactly. Then I there's have, a, there's, yes, sir. Yeah, I think, go ahead. I was just gonna say there's there's a, a person named Alec Mayall. He works uh, mostly up in Temecula, but um, he built he built his own controllers, and you know they they send a signal to his phone telling him what the pressure is, what the um, ETO is, what the uh, uh, temperature is so uh someone like that would be really good to be able to contact because he builds his own stuff and it's it's pretty affordable yeah you know i had another question i could probably ask him you put him in the made... chat rico i'll put his name and number in the chat awesome thank you, thank you. <laughs> yeah because my what i was going to say um my meter is at the very end of my property so i'm probably three four hundred feet from house to meter so even if it did have Wi-Fi, uh, it would have to have a pretty good, strong signal to get it to my house reliably. I think. And I'm guessing I'm on the small side. A lot of you have more acres than I do, so it would be even more of a distance issue. Yeah, the the one I used, the one I saw in the in the I, I showed here in the picture. Um, in the presentation is I have a I have a Campbell Scientific data logger connected to it, which is four thousand dollars. The modem, I mean, it's super duper, um, very expensive instrumentation. Oh, thank you. What's the phone number at the bottom there? The 9514 number, who is that? That's, that's, that's for, for Alec. Alec. That is for Alec, okay. I thought maybe that was it. Sorry about that, I pushed enter before I put the number in. Thank you. Uh, and so he does things just with water or does he do things with every, looks like he has a. He does management, he works in grapes, avocados, citrus. So he's, he's, uh, he's really, really resourceful. Oh. Okay, cool. And he'd have good ideas for irrigation. Yes. And yeah, he works with Grand He works, you know, he works with everybody. So. Right, right. Perfect. Awesome. Thank you so much. You're welcome. <laughs> we've just been doing this for three years. So we've gone from not being farmers to getting a, our, our lime growth certified organic. And now, and, um, and really it's just to make it pay for itself with water, but we're not doing that. <laughs> <laughs> it's getting harder. I've been doing it for 15 years and my water's tripled in that 15 year period, but the crop prices stayed about the same from what I can tell. And yeah, that's so, another question. Yeah. How do you know? That's the hardest thing for me to figure out what to, to sell the market value. You know, like now they're saying, oh, the price of everything's going to go because water's going up. It's like, I know, but how do you know how much service your price? Like, anyway, yeah, I'll have to it's. It's just a, you just have to walk the edge and hope that it works out in your advantage. And I've threatened a few times to cut my trees down, but my wife keeps stopping. Me. I know. Well, if anything else, I think we're sequestering carbon, but you know, it's like <laughs> we're doing our part. <laughs> okay. Okay. Um, well, thank you so much. Um, and yeah. Yeah, I would sit here and pick your brains forever, but I have to go turn my water on. <laughs> you, are you are you so, in the um, middle of trying to figure evening. out? Thank you so much. Hey, Patricia, are you trying to uh -huh. figure out what type of system to go with, whether it's drip or sprinklers or what? Well, we already so we already have like the way. It, between two okay. trees, and then you okay. skip a tree. And then, you, then there's nothing. So you have two trees, a riser in between. And, and so 
you know, I, I, I do understand the part, you know, which is to me very important about the fertilizer too, because I just throw my, I, you know, I, I just throw my fertilizer on the top and because we can't like dig it in because roots are so shallow, right? For limes and stuff. And, um, and there's no way you're right with, with, you know, like, uh, unless you do like the way the people circle the tree with, uh, I was looking at some drip systems and I just can't imagine outfitting that for 700 trees, you know, having, yeah. um, looks like a yeah, soaker like hose going on the whole thing. And then like and you then, say, the risk then, on the drip is that you're, you're running it for so many hours that if you have yes. leaks, you'll waste a lot of water. And yes. the, the micro emitters are kind of a happy medium between those two, it's but they how, have one problem too that I've noticed with mine. And that is they'll clog up with dirt or ants. Right. And I don't I walk it, I don't walk it regularly, but I, in the summer, I walk it every other week because yeah, I have I, a problem. I don't want to go much longer than that. I just always carry them. Yeah, I carry them in my going through the grove and doing things. If I notice there's like the leaves are kind of folding and they look like it's not getting water, then I take off the. the, the, the yeah, so that's the downside. And blow through it and then replace it with another one. That's the downside of the micro is they do require a bit more maintenance because they're clog prone. Yeah, but then, you know, it's better than, I don't know, I, you know, my friends have buried theirs, um, and, but they only have like 20 trees, I have 700 trees, and, you know, yeah. by the, I can't manage all of that, 